My name is Doug, or kids call me Poppy. Respond to either one. We want to welcome you to uh, Faith Bible Church here in person, or if you're online, we want to welcome you to for our coming to uh, uh, the service today. What a great day, right? We had some rain this week and 50 degree weather today, and keep it up. The people in California would really want to come to Texas, right? So don't tell them. Remember, we, it was 128 degrees yesterday, I think. But, but anyway, we just enjoy this cool weather. I want to go over a couple of announcements with you, and then we'll do communion. First couple of things. One, before this service, I think you all know we have Sunday school classes, and we invite you to come to a class. Starts right about 9.30 or 9.40 or so. And uh, there's a listing of the Sunday school classes in your bulletin. So I encourage you to attend one of these. We're thankful that Rita is back. And uh, we see Esther here, also a teacher. And uh, so, well, please consider that. Thank you for your giving. We always uh, value that and ask that you would continue to seek the Lord as how you would give to the church. And so we're so blessed that well, you do help us provide for our operations and for missions and other things. Some upcoming uh, announcements. We, we've got some upcoming events. One of them is we have Pastor Tim coming back next Sunday. There's going to be a potluck dinner next Sunday after the second service. So if you would bring something in a pot, we can all eat. Please bring that next week. And they start taking and receiving those, I think, at 8.30 or 9. And... Uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. In Louisiana, we call it, de we depreciate you. So we, this is Pastor Appreciation Month. So next Sunday, we're going to have a basket. If you want to give Tim and Richie a card uh, or something more tangible about thanking them for the church, there'll be a, a basket for that. Also online, if you want to give for Pastor Appreciation, you can go online and do that. Or if you have a check, you just put it in the offering box. So that's next Sunday after the second uh, service. In the meantime, as we wind Pastor Tim's sabbatical down, if, if you have a need in your life, the, in this bulletin, the names of the elders and the contact information are there. So please don't contact Pastor Tim. This last week, contact one of the elders if we can help you in any way. Also coming up on October 20th is the Singles um, Widowed and Bingo Night. It comes around about once a month. I know they have a great time up here. So that's on the 20th from 6 to 8 here at the church. You'll also notice that um, if you picked up a bulletin today, there's a, attached to it a piece of paper about ransomed life. We're going to be doing a bake sale. November 5th at the church between the services to raise money for Ransomed Life, which is a local organization that helps uh, kids and teens with uh, issues with sexual trafficking. And there's a little bit of information attached to this bulletin, and we'll have some more as we come up. So that's coming up November 5th, the bake sale uh, on that. And right now I want to bring up uh, my wife Becky and Lulu Belts to give us a special announcement uh, concerning the Hill Country Pregnancy and Counseling Center. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Becky Hess, and I am a client advocate at the Pregnancy Center, but I'm also the liaison between the center and our church. Lulu here, I'm going to introduce her to y'all, and she wants to tell you about a new program that's coming, or is, available at the center. Thanks, Becky. Thank you for representing the, the center. Um, you know, not only does a pregnancy care center deal with all things related to pregnancy, um, but we do minister and help those who've had an abortion experience. And um, I know a little while back I'd shared my abortion story with you, and it has been an opportunity for me to just be available for people and also um, let you know how much we love you. But let me just share a little bit. One in four women in the United States have had an abortion. And however many men 
uh, and women, a lot of men and women still feel like they cannot freely speak about their experience. And I know I have struggled many years um, myself, but a lot of people are still holding on to a lot of repressed memories, um, guilt, shame, depression. And our goal at the Hill Country Pregnancy Care Center is to really provide comfortable, loving, safe place and a supportive place for you to heal and find restoration. And so we have started a virtual group support uh, that happens online through Zoom every Thursday from 6.30 to 7.30. And you will see bulletins like this up in, um, in our facility. And just go ahead and feel free to tear one of those and come and join me um, and others who just get to work through uh, taking that first step. And that's the most important thing. Um, there is also, we've made little business cards and they're out in the foyer. And you can just go ahead and pick one up. And if you know of somebody who may have had an abortion experience and they, um, they are struggling, uh, whether they are struggling or not, we just want to be available. So go ahead and just hand them one of that. Very confidentiality, you know, a lot of confidentiality with us. Um, the other thing is, if you know of somebody who's experienced an abortion and they live outside of the area, invite them to join because we will then have resources to refer you out to other local pregnancy centers within their area that may have an abortion, uh, supportive abortion recovery program. So don't be... Um, don't let God hold you in bondage. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Becky. So when you join our Zoom meeting, you don't have to turn on your camera. Your name will be changed, and um, you can choose to change it or turn on your camera. And so we want you to find, take that first step to find the safe place, right? So you can just listen in. You can come in, drop in, drop out at your convenience. No one has to stay there the whole time. And we just want you to know that we want to make this avenue available for others because we want to see um, and provide hope and healing. So thanks for that. Thanks, Lulu and Becky. I think, too, if she didn't mention, it's not only for women, it's also for men. There's a men's Zoom meeting, too, right? that you can uh, participate in if you uh, knew somebody that was impacted by that. One last quick thing before we do announce, before we do communion, is prayer cards in the foyer and the tables. If you have a prayer request, fill one of these out, put it in the box, or go online and fill it out confidentially, and we'd love to pray for you. For communion, I want to go over a verse. We typically, all the time, every Sunday, celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so we celebrate that event in human history by taking communion, right? That's what we do. But there's another verse that came across a while back, Romans 5.10. Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So did you know that we were first reconciled with him through his crucifixion and the shedding of blood, but we were saved by his life. Saved by his life. And that, that takes a while. It took me a while for that little truth to sink into my life, that it wasn't just the death on the cross. That brought me forgiveness and reconciliation. But what really brought me salvation was his life in me. So as we celebrate that Romans 5.10 verse about life, we want to take the little wafer. We want to... Celebrate what Jesus did on that cross 2,000 years ago by dying and shedding his blood. And then with the little grape juice, not only does it represent the blood of the new covenant, but it represents his life, his life in us and all that that means in Jesus' name. Mike Daniels here for us today to give us a message. So we want to welcome Mike up to the... Well, I have great news and not so great news, or I guess I'm happy about something and I'm sad about something. Fall has finally come. That's a really good thing. 
it was just so nice. We went camping with my little nephews uh, and his parents this uh, week, and I came back early. Stace is still there this morning. They're on the lake, and I bet it's cold, which is a new experience. Uh, and that that's really wonderful. And then the bad news is, after five weeks of getting to hang out with y'all, this is the fifth and final week, and I'm very sad about that. It's been, and I want y'all to really hear this. I know we're sort of transitioning. It's message time. We're moving from one thing to the other. People still moving around. That's all great. I want you to really hear this. I am so blessed to have been able to enjoy with you the fellowship of the saints. I want you to just think about the implication of that, that we get to come together and enjoy the experience of God's grace expressed through one another. And especially enjoyable for me getting to do that with those of us that know the grace of God. So to get to really enjoy the fellowship of the saints and those and with those who know his grace. That's a unique and wonderful privilege. I don't think there's anything magical or mystical about our showing up here for a talk on Sunday morning. That in and of itself is not body life. But Christ in you and Christ in me, uniquely expressing Christ to one another is a divine empowered fruit of the Spirit. It's a divine act. So God does something through you for me in his hospitality and uh, revelation and love, and God does something divinely powerful in me, th through me, for you in his revelation and his teaching and hospitality and love. It's love expressed, the persona of love, Jesus Christ himself, expressed through you uniquely. Your personality, your history, your ability, your gifting, your insight, your experience as an expression of the person of Christ in you. You know, the hope of God's glory is not Jesus Christ. That almost sounds heretical. The hope of God's glory is Christ in you. It's not Christ apart from you. It's not you for Christ. Colossians 1.27 says, The mystery revealed in this age after the cross is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I appreciate deeply getting to share in that process of Christ through me and Christ through you engaging in the reality and growth of Christ for one another. It's, it's a unique and powerful experience. And uh, no two messages have been the same. So I had a hard time deciding because I missed a week. Brad taught for me one week when I was sick out of the last five, and it was a challenge for me to go, okay, now I've got an extra message that I had planned. Which one do I choose to, to teach? And I was going to play guitar and sing a song that I wrote uh, a few weeks ago, and so y'all are getting spared that. <laughs> you need to thank Brad because he filled in for me, and you don't have to suffer through the song that I wrote, but I I was gonna. I was thinking um, we might work in another message, and I'd come back uh, next week. But Tim will be back, and I, uh, having heard from him, I know he's chomping at the bit. So uh, I won't deprive y'all of that. But uh, maybe one day I'll do that. The, the reason that I had written the song is because we sing about amazing grace, and rightfully so. But the song says, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound to save a. But I'm a wretch no more. I'm not a wretch. He saved a wretch like I was, and I've been reborn as something entirely different. So because of his amazing grace, I'm not, as Doug was saying, I'm not just forgiven and reconciled by his blood. I'm brought to new life. I'm a new creation. We are reconciled by his blood so that we can be truly saved. Salvation is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not salvation. Salvation is resurrected life. You've been resurrected. You've already died. You've already been resurrected. You've already, out of that spiritual union, been seated in Christ with the Father. All of the work for you to be completely and totally reconciled in experience now has been accomplished. There's nothing left. There's no death left. There's no increasing resurrection. There's no ongoing new birth. There's no ongoing forgiveness. 
You're already completely made new in union forever. Your experience will be unique. You'll grow up in who he's made you. He's not making you new. He has made you new. And you're growing up as the new you. It's okay to grow up. It's okay that we're not very good at it. We're getting better, but it's not us causing better. It's us growing up in what he's already done. There is no more. We're not waiting for another visitation. We're not waiting for something else to happen. We're already spiritually in union with him. There's a, a little curtain call right now where we get to live by faith, and that's not going to last forever. We will not be living by faith. We will be living by sight one day. Anybody felt like your body is betraying you? Because it's getting older and you don't feel older. You just can't move like you're not getting older. Well, that's because, folks, you're not getting older. The body is dying. The body is decaying. We have this euphemism we call age. The body, my body is fading away, but who I am is eternal. And so it feels like a little bit of a betrayal, right? Those of us that have been around, you know, spun around the sun a few times, we're starting to go, this isn't right. No, this isn't you. It seems like, you know, I shouldn't feel this way. No, that's not, your feelings are not who you are. Who you are is eternally secure, forever reborn in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the real you. This body is just a temporal experience. It's good. God can use the body. He's redeemed the body because he's redeemed you in the body. So you can use the body. It's a great tool, completely an available sacrifice, a living sacrifice for God to use. We make this body by our volition available for God to use on the earth. But I'm not putting my hope in how well the body does. Body's fading away. Not putting my hope in how the world does. The world is fading away as we know it. There'll be a new body and there'll be a new earth and there'll even be a new heaven, but there's already a new you. There's already today a new you. You're already new in the old body, on the old earth, <laughs> under the old heaven. Like there's lots that still needs to be made new, but you're not one of those things. Who you are is already new. I want to do something after teaching for three weeks. This is the fourth week out of five. Uh, I want to pass out these cards. Maybe I can recruit someone to, to help me. I'll give a couple there. Can I just yeah, pass them around? And it, as we're talking, or maybe before today even, you had a question about uh, living out of the new covenant or, or forgiveness or the indwelling life or how literal is this spiritual union? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, just pass them around. Uh, yeah, no, I gave a bunch to someone else, so. But just write those down, and I've got a few already. Uh, if we have a few minutes at the end, I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, but I do a live broadcast, Monday through Thursday, every, I mean, God has been so faithful now since COVID started and people were stuck at home. Uh, I started doing this broadcast, and then I did a little bit more, and then I did a little bit more, and it's just grown into its own thing I never expected. So we do this broadcast Monday through Thursday at 8 a.m. Central Time, and uh, people from all over the world join in. It's pretty interactive. People ask questions. About 80% of the time, that's what we do. We just handle people's questions. And so when we get done, I'll either take those up before we get done, or you can leave it in your chair. And if we don't get to your question today, which I don't think we'll get to all of them, maybe not any of them. We didn't in the first service. We had too good a time. Uh, but I'll, I'll get through those in the broadcast. So I just wanted you to know about that. Uh, Mike Q. Daniel is my handle. So you can go to Mike Q. Daniel on Facebook or on YouTube or go to MikeQDaniel.com that you see on the screen up here. So on the website, YouTube, Facebook, you can catch that broadcast live, and it'll stay on there. So if you can't be there at 8, you can come later in the day and watch the day's broadcast. So. Anyway, I want to invite y'all to do that, but I also want to handle questions. I think we like the idea of the new covenant, and then we don't know how to live it out. I think we struggle with it being practical. So we like being sort of knowing the truth, but then we struggle to experience the life. I think we love knowing the truth, and I think we struggle 
to experience the life. When you look at the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience, those are actually things you get to feel. Feelings don't always tell you the truth, but feelings are a gift of God. Feelings can come from the truth. They can also come from life. So as I believe the truth and walk according to the truth, I experience feelings that are in line with the truth. I can actually love people that hate me. It's a miracle. <laughs> I can actually feel accepted while people are rejecting me. It's, it's a divine empowerment. It's like a superpower. You can actually be at peace in the midst of chaos. It there's a feeling that is in line with the truth. So as I believe and put my hope in the Holy Spirit, I don't just get to know the truth. Well, I'm trusting in a peace that I'm not experiencing. He can actually produce peace that I can actually experience. It's a real thing. And I think we're so infantile as the church in our culture today that the secular humanism, I can do anything I put my mind to, of the culture is getting twisted just a little bit and taught in the church that you can get God to do almost anything you want him to do. If you just do enough of the right stuff, then God will bless you. Give more and go more and serve more and work more and show up more and evangelize more and know more and learn more and sing a little louder and God's going to bless you. Here's all of my things I'm doing for God so he'll do some of the things I want from him. That's just, that's a transactional cultural paradigm that is not true of our life in Christ. We live a relational, not transactional life. Your life in Christ is not transactional. Well, it was transactional, right? He paid for it. I got it. And everything after that is me walking in what he's done, me believing and walking with him. It's personal for him. It's personal for him. It's not an idea. It's not a theology. So I think it's a real challenge to make practical what we know because it's relational. I don't get to know it and then see it happen. I have to know it and then during the day, during the week, during the conversations, during the traffic, during the conflict with my spouse, when I'm feeling devalued, when I'm feeling neglected, when I'm feeling rejected, that's my opportunity to go, do I believe? The Holy Spirit wields that truth and goes, you heard and agreed with the truth. Will you put your hope in that truth now, or are you going to be deprived of what the world is costing you? Because the world's not your source. Do you need that affirmation from the person that made you a victim? Do you need the value they stole? Because they'll never pay you back what they took. The person that hurt you is never going to give you back what they took. They're not meant to. They're not designed to. They certainly are not capable of giving you what they took. So you living your life deserving from them what they took instead of out of the sufficiency of what Christ freely gave, you're chaining yourself to something that can never be a source for you. Does that make sense? If you've hurt me, I'm not wrong to be hurt by you, but I don't have to live from that hurt. I can live out of his sufficiency but I can't do both. I can't live out of what I deserve and live out of the wholeness of Christ. I have it, but I'm living as if you're my source and that doesn't work. When Jesus says, abide in me as I abide in you and you'll bear much fruit, meaning he'll produce the fruit that, own, that I get to bear, that reality, he's not saying get in me and get back in me and get back in me. He's saying you are in me. Stop trying to live from anything but me. So abiding isn't getting somewhere you're not. It's living from where you are. It's, it's sitting where you're sat. It's breathing the air you've got. It's living from the vine you're in. So he's not saying, get in me. He's saying, you are in me. Stop trying to live like you're not in me. Live from where you are. And so abiding is not you doing something that's lacking. It's you not trying to get what you lack from some other source the remaining where you are. So I want to look at a verse today in Romans 15 that is kind of challenging maybe the passive paradigm of New Covenant. The biggest problem in the world today <laughs> really is that the world doesn't know how dead they are apart from Christ. When the world pursues everything that they want in their circumstances, the, the saddest saps on the planet are the ones that get everything. Because everything they put their hope in, they've got. They've got nothing left to put their hope in. 
all the money, all the fame, all the power, all the opportunity, all the, you know, how can you get a bigger house? Will that make the difference? Can you get a second boat or a third boat or a second house? Like how many does it take for me to be content? And it's never going to be enough. And they're the saddest people in the world because there's nothing left for them to gain. They actually lose the only hope they had. The rest of the world is living deprived, right? They're thinking, well, when I get enough and when I can relax more and when I don't have to and when that's fixed and they're putting their hope in something they have yet to fully experience. But there's a few people that are truly the saddest people on the planet and they're the ones that have got everything they thought would give them contentment in life. And they're the only ones in the world, right? The unsaved world that have done that and realized how worthless it is. They have it all, and it all means nothing. The rest of us are going, well, I'm trusting God to give me a little bit more, and I'm doing these things in order to cause a little bit more, and got my little side hustle. Listen, hustle culture is not rest. The hustle culture of, of uh, the world, that's not, that's not rest. That's how we're trying to add to what we're doing to do better to get more, and you've already got it all. It's not going to add anything to you. So the saddest thing, biggest problem in the world today is they don't know how dead they are apart from Christ. And that's the saddest thing in the church today. I've said this before here, but it's been a couple of years. The saddest thing in the church is that we don't know how alive we are in Christ. It's even sadder, really. The world doesn't know how dead they are apart from Christ. And we often don't realize how alive we are in Christ. We've got life and we're looking for it from the world. If I could just get a little bit more affirmed from my spouse, they neglected me or they didn't think about me and they were inconsiderate to me and they devalued me and, or my boss you know, didn't see my value or my whatever. We, our kids don't listen to us and we have a lot to contribute. Or whatever it is, we feel diminished by the world and we've got Christ. We've got value. We've got significance and security. For us to want it from the world is even worse than the world not getting it from Christ. We've got it from Christ and we're living for the things that the world wants. So it's horrible that the world doesn't know how dead they are apart from Christ. But it's almost a bigger travesty that in the church today, instead of secular humanism, you can do it. We're teaching a religious humanism that says you can get God to do it. It's the same message. You can either do what you need. That's the idolatry of self, right? You can pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Whatever you set your mind to, you can make happen. No, you cannot. Want to test it? Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three, levitate. <laughs> or love your neighbor more. Mm, trying to love them more. They sure do bug me. Give value to your spouse. Ready? Go. Go. You can't flip that switch. That's something only God can do. Does that make sense? If God's my source, what does it look like to live from it? In a very real way, the enemy loves the lie of separation. Jesus wanted nothing more than us to experience our union with him and our union with the Father and his union with the Father and our union, his union with us. So he's like, I want you to know the union I have with the Father and the Father has with me and you now have with me gives you union with him and his union with you. It's just all of us together. It's oneness. It's what I want you to know. He did not pray that they would know lawfulness. Isn't that interesting? He didn't pray that they would know better behavior. I want you to know what it's like to please God. But he also didn't say, I want you to know how much grace is afforded to you. He didn't say that either. See, grace is the means to something else. It's a relational life. Grace is not a better form of transactionalism. Knowing about grace does not change your experience. Choosing to put your hope in his sufficiency instead of your own his sufficiency instead of your own. Choosing to put your hope in that tomorrow when you're in conflict, that gives God the opportunity to produce through you what only God can do. And then you experience something you've never experienced before. You have a peace that transcends your understanding. You have a love that counteracts the hate. 
that you're receiving. You accept people that reject you. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Loving the guy putting holes in his hands. I don't have holes in my hands, but I will never taste death again. I've already been crucified. I've already been resurrected. And I'm living from the world like a dead man, like a zombie, if I don't choose to put my hope in what I say I know to be true. The enemy loves that lie of separation, that we're not operating from God, we're not in him, but we're also not in life with one another. I'm not in any greater union with God than I'm in union with all of you who are in union with God. Let me say that a little differently. You're in no greater union with Christ than you're in union with everyone else who's in union with Christ. If you're one with him and I'm one with him, we're not two. We're one. So if I choose to divide over your lifestyle, I'm denying the sufficiency of Christ for me. You're a threat to me. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't placate people's sin, but he didn't divide. He didn't avoid. He didn't diminish who they were to him because of their sin. He saw the difference between their own lying beliefs and behavior and their value to him. I will die for you in your sin. And we want to reject them because we feel like it sullies our soul. You're, you're okay. God is not threatened by the sin of humanity. He died for it. He's paid it. He wants everyone to experience it. You aren't going to sully your soul loving people you disagree with. God cares more about your union than he cares about your representation of righteousness. Let him do that. And it's going to look like love anyway, not like law. Every time and twice on Sunday. <laughs> All right, so here's what this looks like to me. The enemy, I've started this several times. The enemy loves the lie of separ separation. And in the midst of those opportunities to divide, to believe the lie of I lack in my circumstances, the lie of lack instead of the truth of the fullness of Christ. One will divide me with other people and the other one will unite me. You'll be going, I hate you, and you're going, it's okay. I love you. What does it cost me that you hate me? You're not my source. I don't you know, want to be around you. All right, well, I'm available if you need anything. I don't have to reject the people that reject me and hate the people that hate me and undermine the people that are undermining me. Why? Because they don't cost me anything. They're not the source of anything. That's divine. And we don't want to do it because we know that it's wrong. And you're right. The people that hurt you, hear me, the people that have hurt you were wrong. But you're never going to be able to get them to make it right. They're not going to ever make it right. That you're not wrong to be hurt doesn't mean that they're a good source to make it right. Live from Christ and you don't need it from them, but you don't get to live out of what they cost you and what he's given you at the same time. You don't get to live from what the circumstance in the world and the hurt cost you. It doesn't make it right. But you can't live from what they cost you and live from what Christ has given you at the same time. You can't live as their victim and it with him as your victor at the same time. Are you winning or losing in that exchange? What they cost me, grace has to afford me. They can never afford to give me back what they took. They can never give me the dignity that I didn't deserve to lose. They can never give me back the security that they're threatening. They can never give me back the value that they've undermined. They can never give back to me the time that they neglected me in. They can never do it. Good thing they're not my source because I can live from wholeness, not hurtfulness. That doesn't mean it wasn't hurtful. We're not advocating for what they did. We're not placating people's sin. We're realizing that they were never my source. I don't have to live from other people's hurt. I can live from the fullness of Christ. Colossians 2 makes it really clear. It says, all of the fullness of God reside bodily in the person of Jesus Christ, and you have fullness in him. Stop living from the lie of lack. Start living from the fullness of Christ. You've, you've got both. The world hurts and God makes you whole. Which one is going to be your source today? God loves the truth of union. The problem is that union comes despite other people's 
hurtfulness and dissension and disparity. I think the Apostle Paul, I've not done the math to check this out, but I actually think the Apostle Paul talked as much or more about union versus dissension and division. He probably talked about that more than he talked about sin. And we're awfully concerned with sinful behavior and lifestyles in the church. And we're not very concerned about divisiveness. Paul was very concerned. He did, Jesus did not say, they will know you by your lawfulness. They will know you by your theology. They'll know you by your... Grace doesn't help you if it doesn't turn into love in practice. Grace does not help you in your experience if it doesn't turn into love in practice. Christ in you is loving people that do not deserve it. Because that's what love is. In him, you get to live a life as accepted in Christ. I know you've been rejected, but you can live accepted. In him, you get to live a life as accepted, as embraced, as empowered, as secure as Christ. And they hung him on a tree. He was no less secure on a cross. We've got to embrace that kind of divine empowerment. He was secure enough to deal with that kind of a threat. He felt valued enough to give his life for people that could never pay him back. Your life is at his expense, and he's happy about that exchange, right? For the joy set before him, Hebrews says, he endured the cross. Well, that's you. That's you. He doesn't want you to pay him back. He wants you to live from the union he paid for. You get to live a life tomorrow not lacking any acceptance, not lacking the divine embrace of God, not missing out on anything that God has for you. We just have to stop mistaking what God has for you as being through everyone and everything around us. The circumstances you're in don't cost you fullness in Christ. They're the context of choosing your source. Do we believe him or not? Growing up in Christ is not getting more of what we want from the circumstances. It's not behaving better in our choices. It's living from a relationship in Christ. I'm never going to walk with Christ and going, Jesus, are we sinning today? Is that what we're doing? I never have to worry about the law, ever. Am I being obedient? People are really concerned about obedience. It's like, are you available for God to use you however he wants? That's the love relationship that is obedience. The Spirit leads and I follow. The God my father provides and I as the child receive. I'm not living to cause what I need. I'm living from the provision of God. He as God provides and directs. I as his child receive what he provides and follow his direction. I don't have to go, is this what I'm supposed to be receiving from you? He's like, all of it, all of it. I love when Jesus gives the communion. He says, take and eat, take and drink, all of it. Drink all of it. Don't take part of it. Take all of it. All right, so the reality is in our trying to believe that we've got it all in him, but feeling like we're lacking in our circumstances, can anyone else relate in, in that? Like, man, my circumstances feel very insecure. Uh, since COVID, I've shifted. My ministry is not really a traveling, speaking event very much. Not nearly. It's probably about half as much. And I do a lot online for free. I do a lot online <laughs> for free. Small groups all over the world have me showing up online and speaking in their small group. Never even comes up what that would cost them because Christ already paid for it. They have to receive it for free. They can contribute to the ministry if God leads, and they'll follow that. You see, there's no fee to that. Whereas someone calls me up and says, Mike, can you come do a leadership event in Atlanta? Sure. They're, they expect there to be a fee for that. There's no fee for me meeting with the pastor at 2 a.m. in Atlanta online because he has an elder whose kid's in crisis and he's not sure what to do. And heaven forbid the pastor not know what he's supposed to do. Who punches that clock? It's not the most secure way to make a buck. <laughs> there's no clock. And I'm here to tell you, I'm as, a, I'm as secure as Christ was with the Father. He gets to do what he wants. You are as loved and secure and empowered 
and valued as Christ. Watch this. Romans 15 verses 5 through 7 says this. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement, endurance and encouragement, let's call that hope, right? Things are going badly and I'm encouraged. Things are going badly and I'm given endurance. Let's kind of put those together with a shorthand and call that hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement, hope, give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ had. Let's call that harmony. Hope and harmony. The God who gives you hope when things look bad can give you harmony when things look divisive. The God who gives you hope when things are not going well, you're hoping that things will go well. When you don't have enough from the circumstance, he's giving you encouragement that it's coming, I'm enough, and endurance to persevere until then. He's giving you hope beyond your circumstances. Listen, he can give you harmony beyond your divisiveness. Your conflicting theology is not a spiritual gift. I got to write that down because that one was for me. Where's my pen? Our, our theological prowess is not a spiritual gift. It's just not listed. It's loving people who disagree with us. That's the spiritual gift. You love them no less when they disagree with you. What would it look like for us to care more about winning hearts than winning arguments? God doesn't want you to do anything for blessing. He wants to bless other people through you and he's wondering if you will trust him enough to let him. He doesn't want you to do anything for blessing. It's all by grace or it's not gonna glorify God. It's all by grace or it's not going to speak of him, it's gonna speak of you. Look how much I'm doing for God. Well, good for you, I guess. What are you hoping will come from that? Look at all that God has done for me. And he, his renown is elevated in our experience. Look at the goodness of God to me. I don't deserve any of this. I'm worth it, but I don't deserve it. Could you wield the grace of God like that in your life? May that God who gives endurance and encouragement, not all your needs from your circumstances, He's just encouraging you and giving you endurance when they're not what they're supposed to be. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you because it's not good. He's actually giving you grace to endure and be encouraged in what you don't like. We're thinking, God, what am I doing wrong? He's like, nothing. That's why I'm encouraging you. That's why I'm helping you endure. The circumstances, frankly, suck. That's not the proof of my love. The cross is the proof of my love. Trust the God from the cross who gave his life for you through Jesus Christ that he's the God of encouragement and endurance in the circumstance you don't like. You're not doing something wrong. This is the context of shifting your hope from this to him, from transaction to relationship. This is it. This is your chance. You say you believe. Believe. Maybe believing isn't agreeing with an idea as much as it is shifting my hope from what I want from the circumstance or from God through a circumstance and just thinking that he's enough. His grace abounds in me in this. We really don't want a life that looks like Jesus' life, and yet he is the life. No one's been more glorified and satisfied with their life than Jesus. He accomplished everything. And we look at that and we go, yeah, no thanks. But he's not going to live someone else's life through you. He's going to live his life through you, sacrificially loving, at peace through his father, completely overjoyed for the sake of other people who reject him. No one was happier than Jesus. I really believe it. Not a soul has ever walked the earth in greater contentment than Jesus. Fully present all the time with his father. This is the good life. We just don't think it. We think the good life is a little bit bigger house that's paid off a little bit sooner or whatever. He goes on and says, may that same God that gives you the hope bring us into in an attitude of harmony. You're in union with everything Christ is in, everyone Christ is in union with. You're in union 
with everyone Christ is in union with. He wants us to be harmonized in our life together so that there's more glory through the harmony than there is in the solo. There's more glory in the harmony than there is in the solo. Even if we're playing the same note like Tim and I, right? Tim comes up and teaches the same thing I teach. We're, we're not even harmonizing. We're like playing the same string the same time. Same message, same truth, same identity, same grace. I love that. I don't get to do that all the time. It's fantastic to get to do that with Tim. Y'all have heard the same message, I know, from a different voice. Same message. That's wonderful. That's unison. It's still better than a solo. Whether it's in unison or harmony, God is more glorified by the sum of our lives together in him than he ever would be by our lives apart. He says, may he give you that attitude of harmony because of Christ far greater than anything that would divide you. You have different theology? Well, praise God we're both saved. Praise God we're both in Jesus. Oh, you don't know that you're in Jesus? Oh, you think Christ in you is just figurative? Whew, I'm glad I don't believe that. Love you. Oh, you think your identity in Christ is what you earn from him? I don't believe that. Sure do love you. May you do that so that with one mind and one voice, you may, you there is plural, it's y'all, Paul is Texan. He's not from Arkansas, that'd be Ewans. We don't say Ewans. So that with one mind and one voice, you all may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the beautiful plurality of union? Our Lord. One voice, one God, one Father, one mind. Why? Because we agree about everything? No, we're just in union with him. What if our relationships are of greater value than our conflicts? What if I want to win hearts and be in union with you because of your value more than my issue and argument and conflict? Then I can eat with people that hate me and have. Look how he finishes this in verse 7. I didn't put it on the screen for you guys. I have no idea why I did that. But verse 7 says this. This is his summary of that idea. He says, accept one another then. That seems so simple, right? Accept one another then. People come and say, Mike, my, my family's going through this lifestyle thing and this event, and I'm not sure, should I go? Am I endorsing that? Should I not go? Should I love them anyway? Oh, yes, love them anyway. Let's just start there and then deconstruct. What does it look like to love them sacrificially? I'm not telling you to go or do or say yes or say no. I'm saying start with you love them unconditionally and then deconstruct what it looks like to love them instead of should I stand in the truth at their expense? No, 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 no. You stand in the truth for their benefit. What does it look like to do it for their benefit? Let's start with love and deconstruct the behavior, not start with the behavior and try to figure out how to love them while you're doing that. Let's not figure out how to love people while we're disagreeing with them. Let's just love them and then not worry about disagreeing with them. Let's eat with the sinners. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, man, I'm glad he's not coming back next week. He's just meddling. <laughs> Accept one another then. Accept one another then. You know, Jesus didn't treat the disciples differently than he treated the tax collectors. The only difference was he dragged the disciples with him to the tax collector's house to eat. He just assumed they'd be with him when he went and fellowshiped with the sinners. He did not love the disciples more than he loved the harlot. He just dragged them along with him. Guess what he's going to do through you? You get to love like that. You get to have peace like that. You just don't get it from everybody else. But they're not your source, so it's okay. Accept one another then. If you're one heart and one mind and you have the encouragement and it's all a gift and it's all from him, if that's the economy of it, it's all by grace, then accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What you do for God does not help him. 
what you let him do through you, the divine love and embrace of God through you that he's given to you, that same embrace, that speaks of him. That word, I'll, I'll end with this. I'm not watching my time very closely. Um, we're okay. Don't look. It's all right. That word, accept, he uses it twice in one verse. He says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. That word accept, it, in the Greek, it's pros lumbano. It's a compound word. Pros is the same phrase that... Uh, John uses in John 1, 1, when he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, meaning you can identify them, but you can't really separate them. They're, it, it literally means face-to-face, -face, pros, close. So when I teach John 1, 1, I say, you can see Jesus and you can see God, but you can't really see where one begins and the other ends. There's no separation. There's no space. It literally means there's no space in between them. So how do you know where one begins? Even my hand on my face, you can tell where the hand is and where the face is, but you may not be able to see where they're contacting, right? It's not like you can go, oh, there. You, know, you can't see it at the same time. You can't see the point of contact at the same time. That's too close. That's God the Father and God the Son. They're with, pros. Except is pros lumbano, with. Close, inseparable. And lumbano means to take up. It's a choice. It says, I've taken this up and, and brought it. Pros, close. Lumbano is to take up and pros is close. I've taken someone up and brought them close. Since you've been taken up and brought into intimate, inseparable union with Christ, you need to take up and bring close into inseparable union through Christ everyone else. Pros, close. Inseparable, close. Union feels so costly until you realize you don't have to pay the cost. Union feels so costly because you have to set down all these things that you value. I care about my opinion. I care about where I've been hurt in the past. I care what's been taken away from me. I care about the security that that threat threatens. Bad phrase, sorry. I, 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 I care about these things and I've got to put them all down for the sake of union. It's a good thing that where that stuff comes from doesn't cost me. I can give up my dignity from you because you're not the source of my value. I can give up my acceptance from you for the sake of union because you're not the source of my acceptance. I can even give up some of the security from you because you're not the source of my security. You can threaten me and I'm secure. You can reject me and I'm accepted. You can hate me and I'm loved because you're not my source. And I can't live from both what you cost me and what grace provides. I don't have feet in both of those. I cannot live from the flesh and according to the spirit at the same time. They're in conflict. I can't move in two directions. <laughs> am I marching, dancing with the spirit or am I dancing with the flesh? What I need from you, rightfully, I deserve it. You shouldn't treat me that way. <laughs> or am I dancing with Jesus? I have everything. What they do doesn't affect me. Who's leading the dance? The flesh or the spirit? You think you're leading. That's the flesh. <laughs> you think that it's you leading. I'm doing what I need to to get what I need. Yeah, no, that's actually not you. That's the flesh. Who you are is in the spirit. So all that to say, we get to take up and bring close out of union with one another just as Christ is taken up and brought close. Intimate fellowship in order to praise God. Why does it praise God? Because I'm not living from them as the source. God's grace is sufficient for my union lived out with you. All of God's gifts, hospitality, faith, interceding for one another in prayer, revelation, teaching, pastoring, shepherding, all of those should look like that, that I would, I won't do this to you, but that I would, she's like, <laughs> that I would take someone up and bring them close, and they would go, yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, I don't really either, but it's more valuable to me than what it costs me. It's uncomfortable. Grace affords it. That's what revelation looks like. That's what pastoring looks like. 
I don't get to show up on Sunday morning and say, I'm pastoring these people. No, I don't. This is not relational engagement with you. I, I, I need to be engaged in union with you. We need to do life together for you to feel loved by me. You might get a taste of it, the hope of it from what someone says. But where am I sacrificing for you? There's got to be opportunity for that. What might it mean for you to accept others as Christ accepted you, to take them up at your expense, to bring them close and, and elevate union, to elevate, elevate relationship over behavior, over conflict, that you would choose them over what you want from them? What would that look like? As Christ has already completely and forever accepted you. In Christ, in Christ, there are a thousand reasons that you might be rejected by other people, but there's none left for you to reject them. There are no reasons left for you to reject them. He's bought all your excuses. Does that make sense? There are a thousand reasons you can reject me or what I teach or what I share. There's lots of stuff, but there's none left for me to reject you because you can't cost me anything that grace hasn't provided. There are a thousand reasons why the world might reject you. In different ways, they might reject you, hurt you, deprive you. But there's none left for you to reject them. There are no reasons left. Grace is enough for you. Grace is enough for you. I'm not denying they've hurt you or owe you. Does that help you somehow? <laughs> but they hurt me. I totally believe you. How does that help you? They owe me. Well, good luck. <laughs> I don't know how that helps you. Is grace enough for you? What will you do with the grace of God? Because it is not meant for you to feel better about yourself. His love for you is not just for you. His empowerment for you is not just for you. His peace for you is not just for you. His security for you is not just for you. It's meant for you to give away. It's active and dynamic, living and breathing, that you would live from heaven's air while still under the surface on the earth. Live from there, not here, because this place will kill you. Maybe you've noticed. It's a good thing it's not your source. Does that make sense? Father, I thank you that you don't just let us come together and you're not just inviting us to come together. You've called us to live out of the union that we have with you with one another. Father, I even thank you that it's costly so that you will be elevated in our experience and in this world because we trust you by grace more than what we need from each other. So we can afford what union costs because your grace affords it to us. Father, show us what it means to live in union with a couple dozen people in a room so that we can start to be sacrificially loving to a community that doesn't even know grace, that doesn't think the church is about grace, that doesn't know that our life with you is relational, not transactional. They haven't even begun to see the love and sufficiency of God because we barely scratch the surface of it with each other. Make us radically available for what feels like a costly hospitality, a costly love for one another, a costly gifting doesn't benefit me. It's my venue of loving other people. Show us what it means to be radically available for you to do what only you can do, and it looks so lavishly expensive. Show us that so that this community, Father, can know your life and sufficiency in their marriages, in their community, in their identity. But more than knowing it, they can then become a beacon of it. We could live it out. Don't let us puff up our minds another moment. Because, Father, I believe that your grace to me is useless in my experience unless it turns into the orthopraxy, the practice of loving other people. Show us what that looks like. 
Make us bold in our love in practical ways this week. I thank you for these saints, for us as your kids being able to come together for your glory by your grace. And as we part today, Father, let us not lose sight of the union that we share, the hope that we share, the mind that we share, the singularity of life in Christ that we share and make you known to the praise of the glory of your grace. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. You guys, leave your cards there. I will answer. I'll be, I have a stack from the first service. I'll be going through those on the broadcast, 8 a.m., Monday through Thursday. You can find me on Facebook at Mike Q. Daniel or YouTube at Mike Q. Daniel or come to MikeQDaniel.com. It's on the screen up there, and uh, you can catch the broadcast or past broadcasts there. So uh, I'll try to, if their names are on them, they don't have to be, but I'll mention your name on the broadcast so you'll go, oh, it's my question. <laughs> but anyway, thank you all so much for letting me be here. Know Christ today. He is the life. Grow in grace today because he's the source. And go love like crazy because that's what he's up to. Have a great week. Thank you all.